to everyone. It is a pleasure to be uh, in your midst. I want to start off by thanking uh, your very fine uh, leadership and your uh, very fine uh, minister, uh, the elders as well, for extending me this opportunity uh, to come and to speak to you uh, a word uh, from the Lord. Uh, I have been here uh, several times and am impressed uh, with your minister, uh, Brother Meadows. We've developed uh, somewhat uh, of a pretty good relationship, I think, and so he is someone I hold in, in very high regard, as I do uh, the members uh, here. He always speaks uh, well of you and about you, uh, and you ought to be commended uh, for that. Uh, for those of you who do not know, I'm the senior minister at the Crawford Road Church of Christ uh, in Rock Hill, South Carolina. I have been the minister, I've been privileged to be the minister there uh, since August of 1999, so it'll be 20 years uh, next year. Uh, they're not tired of me yet, so they haven't gotten rid of me yet, uh, so they're letting me uh, hang around. I uh, certainly want to uh, identify to you all uh, my lovely wife who has uh, made the trip uh, up here uh, with me just in case you guys don't know who she is or where she is, just raise your hand. And so it's good to have her uh, with us uh, in uh, the house of the Lord. If you have your Bibles, let us turn them to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. We will read into your hearing verse 25 to verse number 37. And then we will uh, proceed to uh, give you the lesson and then uh, let you go. Luke 10, verse 25 to verse number 37. The Bible reads on this wise, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do likewise. And the topic I've been assigned is following the race. Following the race. And I take that uh, from this text, following the interaction uh, of the race, following the interaction uh, of the races. Now, certainly those of us who have been in the church for any length of time have heard of or run across or been taught this in Bible school or heard lessons preached on the Good Samaritan. It is a very noteworthy story. It is a very important story that is as germane to us in the 21st century as it was in the first century when the story was explained by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This term, Good Samaritan, is very familiar uh, to us uh, as we see it all around us, uh, particularly in the not-for-profit world. There are many uh, charity-based 
organizations that have Samaritan uh, in the name. There are many of us, when we recognize someone doing something nice for someone else, we think within ourselves, or we may even say audibly, that that person was being a good Samaritan. And all of that flows back to uh, this uh, particular story. But the fact that good deeds were done from one man to another is just on the surface. We need to get deep beneath that to really get the understanding and the intent and the deep meaning that is inculcated, that is in uh, this particular story. So let's go on ahead and, and get started. Let's go back to Luke 10, verse 25. It says, verse 25, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him or tested him saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life. Now, this particular lawyer was not a lawyer that we would think of uh, today. Uh, someone who tries cases or someone who prepares uh, legal documents to be signed that might be protective of one individual from another or one entity uh, from another. This particular individual was a lawyer, someone that was astute, someone that knew on a deep level the law of Moses. So he seems to be asking a question that he thinks he knows the answer to. For he says, uh, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And so he tempted Christ, he tested Christ, seeming to have uh, an ulterior motive behind uh, his, his question. Now, we want to focus on the word do there for just a moment. The lawyer says, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? This word do, it is to be understood and defined in a way that suggests it is a single, solitary act of obedience. The lawyer, it seems, wants to take the easy way out. What one thing do I need to do to inherit eternal life? So I can get that out of the way and check that off of the box. But those of us who are members of the Lord's church, those of us who are concerned about making heaven our home, understand that it's not just one act of obedience that's going to get us there, but it is a lifestyle characterized by continually to obey the word of God 24 hours a day, seven days a week, whenever we have the opportunity, whenever there is blood running warm in our veins or air in our lungs, we're in our right mind, we are duty bound to obey God presently all of the time and so he says and behold a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him saying master what shall I do to inherit eternal life verse 26 and he said unto him what is written in the law how readest thou and I think it's interesting that when Christ responded to his question about what shall I do to inherit eternal life Christ responded to him what is written that tells me that eternal life is connected to what is written. If you want eternal life, you have to look through the pages of inspiration to find out what is written about eternal life and then do them, not just one time, but continuously as a form of lifestyle, as a habit. And so uh, the Lord says, what is written in the law? How readest thou? Verse 27, and he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind. Now that goes back to Deuteronomy chapter number six and verse uh, number five where Moses is giving his farewell address uh, to the people of uh, uh, God, the children of Israel, before they are to go into the promised land. He says in Deuteronomy six uh, in verse number four, hear O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Then he proceeds to say, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind. The concept there is, understand that God is one and you owe your allegiance to him. Verse five, understand that since God is one and you owe your allegiance to him, that is to be characterized by you giving everything that you have to God. 
all you are, all your talents, all your ability. You put your pocketbook at his disposal. You put your home at his disposal. Those things that he has blessed you with, those talents and the abilities, you put all of those things at God's disposal and you do whatever you can, whenever you can to live for God, no matter what the crowd is saying, no matter what naysayers are saying, you do everything that you can to live for God. And so that's what he says here in the first part of verse 27. And then he says, at the end of the verse, and thy neighbor as thyself. So we're duty bound to love God, and we're also duty bound to love neighbor. There is a vertical responsibility that we all have to love God. And there is a horizontal responsibility that we have to our neighbor to love our neighbor. Now, there's no qualification put on loving your neighbor. It doesn't say love your neighbor and other things behind it. It just says generally love thy neighbor. Let's follow this. And he says, verse 28, and he said unto him, thou hast answered right this do now that word do is characterized by action that is continuous it's not just a one-time act of obedience this do in verse number 28 is characterized by a continuous lifestyle of obedience every day you do everything that you can because you love God and you love your neighbor to obey the will and the word of God. And so he says in verse 28, and he said unto him, thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. The lawyer responds in verse 29, but he willing to justify himself. He has an air of self-righteousness, but he willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, who is my neighbor. Basically, he's getting smart with the Lord, okay? Uh, he says, who is my neighbor? And so the Lord goes into a discourse about who his neighbor is. Let's take a look at that. He says, verse number 30, and Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves which stripped him of his raiment or his clothing and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, let, let's, let's paint the picture. You have Jerusalem in the region of Palestine known as Judea. You have Jericho to the north. But the verse indicates that a certain man is going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, from Jerusalem to Jericho is about 17 or 18 miles. Under ideal conditions, the trip would take about six hours to make. Usually, conditions were not ideal, so the trip would take about uh, eight hours. Now, it's going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, the down, as far as elevation goes, would be about 3,500 or 4,000 feet to go from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Now, this was a notoriously dangerous route to take. Even in broad daylight, there were some portions of this road which were completely dark. And so it seems to be an ideal place for thieves and robbers to hang out waiting on some passerby to come by so that they can relieve him or her of their belongings, of their possessions. And what we all need to realize is this, in some sense or fashion, we're all on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. And it is just by the grace and the mercy of God that we have not fallen among thieves, that we have not fallen among robbers. God is smiling on us and that while we are on this road 
from Jerusalem to Jericho, trying to make it from point A to point B, trying to metaphorically make it from labor to reward, trying to make it to heaven, that God is taking care of us and that we have been privileged not to have to deal with having fallen among thieves and robbers. I don't know if any of you all have ever been mugged before. I have not. I have had to endure people who have tried to mug me, and so I know something of what that feels like uh, to, to know that somebody is after you and trying to take your things, uh, but I guess God blessed me to be able to run really fast to get away from these people. Uh, but we see here that this particular man falls among thieves and robbers. And he says in verse number 30, again, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among thieves, and they stripped him of his clothing. They wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. So it's not just enough that they stole his wallet and they took his watch and they took his car. Well, they wouldn't be maybe driving a car. Maybe he had a, a, a donkey or an animal or a cart of some sort. Not only did they do that, they did physical and bodily harm to him, and they left him half dead. They left him in a destitute state. Now remember, the lawyer is saying, who is my neighbor? I got the vertical part, I love the Lord, but you're telling me, Lord, to love my neighbor, and the lawyer, the one who knows the law, get smart with the Lord and he says who is my neighbor and the Lord starts out identifying this certain man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho who fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing who wounded who was wounded by these men and left half dead he goes on to say in verse number 31 the Lord that is it says and by chance there came down a certain priest that way and when he saw him he passed by on the other side and likewise a Levite when he was at the place came and looked on him and passed by on the other side and so it looks like the priest and the Levite had other pressing matters to take care of and they couldn't be bothered with helping a man, a Jewish man, who was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now one might ask, who are the Levites and who are the priests? Levites, who were not priests, were assigned duties in connection with the tabernacle. They assisted the priests, they prepared, for example, the cereal offering, and they cared for the courts and the chambers of the sanctuary. The priests were descendants of Aaron. The priest was a teacher of the law and performed certain cleansing rituals and he presided over legal matters. Now notice, these men appear, as it says, in verse number 31, and by chance there came down, so they're going from Jerusalem to Jericho, down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side, and likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. These were the religious men who should have shown compassion on a fellow Jewish person. Let me show you something in Hosea uh, chapter number six. Hosea chapter six. Let me read this for you uh, right uh, quick because it is important uh, for us uh, in the lesson. Hosea six, verse six says this. For I desired mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. In other words, God is concerned about folk following not just the letter of the law, for example, but the spirit of it. In other words, God is interested, God is pleased when we as his people will be inconvenienced to help someone else. Now, I'm sure uh, the priests 
uh, and the Levite had pressing business to take care of in Jericho. Perhaps the priest and the Levite didn't somehow want to have themselves defiled by handling this man who had been fallen among thieves. But Hosea tells us in Hosea 6 that the Lord desires mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. And that tells me as the people of God today that it is our duty to be inconvenienced on behalf of of our neighbor. Certainly those, there are those of us who are here who have been helped by other people when it just seemed like everything was uh, falling apart. Certainly folks have shown mercy unto us when we needed mercy and didn't look for a way not to show us mercy, not to help us, not to help us get over the problems and the trials and the troubles uh, that we were going through. And so the priests and the Levite, Jews, who should have helped this man who fell among thieves, pass by on the other side. And when we go back to Luke chapter number 10, and we pick things up in verse number 33, it says, But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. Now, Samaritans were looked down upon by Jews. Samaritans were viewed as a half mixture, so to speak, of Israelite uh, and Gentile lineage. In other words, they were not looked upon as purely Jewish people, as purely Hebrew people. For lack of a better term, they were looked upon as half-breeds, so to speak. And we see this certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. He came where uh, the man who had fallen among thieves was. And when he saw him, watch this, he had compassion on him. Now when we look at this word compassion, it means to suffer with. It means you identify with somebody's sufferings enough that it moves you to do something. Uh, if you remember uh, Luke chapter uh, 15, I believe it is, Luke chapter 15 and verse uh, number 20, where it talks about the lost son, uh, the prodigal son, it says uh, of uh, the, the, the son who was lost and the father says in verse 19 uh, well verse 18 he says and I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him father I have sinned against heaven and before thee this is the prodigal son he's lost everything he's eaten with the hogs and now he gets the idea that listen I've messed up and what I'll do is I'll go back to my father's house and I'll just beg to be a servant so that I can get out of this mess that I've gotten myself in. That's verse 18. In verse 19, he says, And am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. That's his plan. Verse 20, And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had what? compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And so we see that the father didn't have anger or uh, he didn't express to his son who was lost that he was mad. He had compassion on him and that moved him to do something about the suffering that the young man had been in. He said, listen, we're going to have a feast. We're going to have a party. My son who was lost has now been found. And that's what this Samaritan man had on this Jewish man. Someone, they, they did not like each other. They did not keep company uh, with one another. They looked down uh, on one another. And this Samaritan man has compassion on this Jewish man who has fallen among thieves, who has been mugged and left for half dead. We see this here, a great example of how we are to interact with one another. Not just in the church, but with our fellow man. 
with those whom we may not uh, identify. He says, again, verse number 33, but a certain Samaritan as he journeyed came where he was and when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And so his help, the Samaritan man to the Jew is quite extensive. Look at it again. He binds up his wounds. He pours in oil and wine. And certainly there seems to be some kind of mixture that was undertaken uh, to apply uh, to wounds. And so he binds up his wounds, pours in oil and wine, sets him on his own beast, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Now we look at the phrase, took care of him, it, it indicates that he probably cared for the man for an extensive period of time. The, the, the definition there, the picture of the definition there is of a mother looking after a sick child. Certainly when we were, when we were young and we got the sniffles and we got the flu or something of that sort, our moms would watch over us and administer medicine to us and make sure that we were breathing properly and healing properly and they would do this for many times all night long. And this is the kind of care that the Samaritan man gave to this Jewish uh, man. He bound up his wounds, he poured in oil uh, and wine, set the man on his own beast, brought him to an end and took care of him, looked after him as a mother would look after one of her sick children. And he says, on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, two, about two days wages, and gave them to the host and said unto him, take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Now when you study this out, the amount of money that the Samaritan gave to the innkeeper would probably cover about two or three weeks stay in this particular inn. If we were to put that in monetary terms today, if we were to take somebody to an inn or a hotel of today, uh, we would pay uh, the equivalent uh, of about $1,500 when you compare what this man paid in Luke 10 and bring it up to what that represents in monetary terms to us today. And my point is, uh, this is just, he didn't just go into his pocket and give the man a couple of dollars. He put his wallet at the disposal of this man so he could help facilitate this man getting his health back and getting to uh, where he needed uh, to be. Compassion, suffering with. And so it says on the morrow, verse 35 again, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, take care of him and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Now this seems to indicate uh, that the Samaritan has a pretty good reputation and possibly he has stayed here uh, several times before because it seems to indicate that the innkeeper is okay with taking this money with the idea that uh, the one who had fallen among thieves may use up more uh, in the way of charges than the Samaritan man has left. And so the innkeeper seems to be okay with settling up with the Samaritan man when he comes back again, which should give us an indication of the reputation and the kind of person uh, the Samaritan man was. Now verse number 36 says, which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves between the priests and the Levite and the Samaritan. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. He can't even bring himself to say the name Samaritan. And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said unto him, go and do likewise. And that's our charge today. We have to look beyond color. We have to look beyond class. 
We have to look beyond socioeconomic status. We have to look, upon, look beyond educational level. We have to look beyond where people live in relation to where we live. We have to look beyond what people wear and how they look in public uh, in relation uh, to how we have to look beyond all of that and not only love God, but love our neighbor as well. And this means, this word neighbor means one who is near. It means your fellow man. It doesn't mean the person who stays right next to you, who you're cool with, and you guys talk about your children and your grandchildren and about uh, sport. It's not talking about that particular individual. It talks, it, 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 it means one who is near, your fellow man, your fellow woman. When you have the opportunity and you find someone in need, you need to be moved with compassion like the rich man was with his son who had, was lost and came home, like Christ has been with us and on several individuals that we read about in the Bible showing compassion on them, we have to have that same kind of mentality, that same kind of mindset toward our neighbor, our fellow man. And if we have that kind of attitude, not just in the church, but outside of the church, we would have a better world, we would have a better society with much less problems and a lot more togetherness and getting along so that all of us can try to make heaven uh, our home. Following the race. If you're here and you're not a member of the Lord's church, and what we mean by that is you're not a member of the Church of Christ. We extend to you the invitation to become a member of the Church of Christ. And by that we mean to become a member of God's saved community, to become a member of his church, the Lord's church that is, to become a member of God's family. Well, how do you do that? You have to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have to hear it. The fact that Jesus Christ died, he was buried, he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4. Next you must believe that gospel. Then you repent of your sins. Next you confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then we baptize you in water for the remission of your sins. Then God adds you to the church. And you ought to walk in newness of life, Romans 6 and verse number 4. Perhaps you are here and you are already a member of the church of Christ and you have not been loving your neighbor as you should. You haven't maybe been loving God as you should, and you have not been involved in a continuous doing, a continuous obedience to the will and the way of God, and that has left you in a sinful state. This is your opportunity to get right with God uh, as well. It is necessary, it is vital for us, if we wanna make heaven our home, for us to repent when the need arises. Luke 13, three says, I tell you nay, except you repent, you should all likewise perish. I'm done, this lesson is yours. If you need to respond to this invitation, I want you to come right now, as together we stand.